I'm going to talk about, um, uh, about neuroscience, and in particular, my talk is about showing how uh, our, our brain, which is a very high dimensional uh, system, can in fact be uh, explained by a much lower dimensional uh, set of latent variables. So <clears throat> first I'll, uh, I will explain how we can image the activity of entire brains in zebrafish. And then secondly, I'll explain how we use generative modeling to model the system and infer low dimensional representation. And thirdly, we will look at some results that we found uh, explaining um, how, how the brain is uh, organized. So to, uh, to image an entire brain, what we need is a small, very small uh, animal model uh, where it's actually feasible to image um, um, all of the brain and most of the brain at the resolution of single cells. And uh, so what we use are zebrafish, so this is an uh, adult zebrafish, um, who have stripes horizontally rather than vertically, but uh, what can you do? Um, and um, we're in fact interested in zebrafish larvae, who are only a couple of days old. And we're interested in them because the skin is translucent. So we can see directly through the skin um, and we can image the brain. So we can perform microscopy of the brain without needing to do any surgery. And in these fish, um, they're genetically modified such that um, when brain cells become active, they become fluorescent with green light. So uh, just by doing microscopy, uh, we can then image and see which brain cells are active. Um, and the way to do this is um, with a setup called light sheet microscopy, where we use a laser to illuminate a 2D plane of light uh, through, the, through the zebrafish brain, which we, we can then image. Um, and then we vertically move the, this 2D plane very rapidly. So effectively, we get a stack of 2D planes, which together makes up a volume. And we can record these volumes of neural activity at single cell resolution at about three to four hertz, typically. Um, and so, uh, actually, when I started working on this type of data some years ago, one of the first questions we had is, well, how can we visualize this very high dimensional time series data without, uh, you know, becoming crazy looking at a lot of uh, 2D plots? So uh, we developed this 3D GUI. Um, and so I'm just going to show you a video now of some uh, brain activity. So what you'll see is a gray outline, which is the, uh, the outline of the brain. And then the activity of cells imaged during spontaneous activity, so without any stimulation. Um, and I've binarized the activity. So uh, cells are either on or off. And it works. So, um, yeah, so we're looking top down uh, from top to the bottom of the brain. And essentially, we see a lot of like noisy activity, right? We see uh, cells flicker on and off. But at the same time, we also can clearly see some structure, right? A lot of cells coactivating groups and in different configurations. Um, so this really gives us a hint that even though this activity is very high dimensional and complex, we should be able to model the system uh, by trying to infer these, uh, this small number of, uh, these small numbers of groups of cells, which are called assemblies, um, and see how they together can make up the activity. Yeah, so I, I just, to, to repeat, we're interested in knowing can a low dimensional organization of these assemblies, so groups of cells, explain this high dimensional uh, neural activity? And uh, we're definitely not the first people to, to have asked this. Um, and previously, a sort of naive approach has been to map this high dimensional activity onto uh, a set of a low dimensional set of latent variables, right? So, for example, using PCA. And although this can be very useful for some applications, uh, we think it doesn't actually prove that a low dimensional set of variables is sufficient to generate this high dimensional activity. So instead, we're essentially flipping this argument and saying, well, we like to, uh, to, to create a generative model uh, and see if low dimensional variables can together create the uh, sort of complex high dimensional activity. So instead of using PCA or clustering methods, like these deterministic methods that just map high dimensional activity to another space, uh, we're looking to build a generative model. So to construct this model, um, so um, uh, just uh, let's start with a network of neurons that are uh, connected. And uh, we, we've recorded the binary activity using microscopy. And so our hypothesis is that this high dimensional activity, which we'll call V because the neurons are visible, um, 
can in fact be modeled conditioned on a low dimensional set of hidden units hidden units h and um, so the idea is that hidden units project to neurons in different combinations and by different activations of these hidden units we should be able to model the uh, um, visible activity but at the same time hidden units are of course just latent variables so they themselves are in fact also defined by the activity of the neurons okay so what we're looking for is a generative model p uh, of both the activity of the visible units the neurons and the hidden units uh, that we can uh, structure in these in these two uh, layers so the simplest way to do this is with what's called a restricted Boltzmann machine, um, where we connect a layer of neurons to a layer of hidden units, and we allow interactions between these two layers, but not within uh, either of the layers. And um, um, so I'm not sure, maybe some of you will already be familiar with restricted Boltzmann machines. They've been around for uh, a while. Um, and so just to mention, our contribution has been um, steering the solution of this compositional uh, of this RBM um, to a solution where the weights are not too sparse on the left and also not too dense on the right, but something that sits in the middle. Um, and for the connoisseurs, that means that we um, essentially add a sparsity constraint and we also change the potential of the hidden unit. But back to the uh, just the RBM in its original formulation. So. Um, to derive the, the model P for this uh, architecture, uh, we use a maximum entropy approach. So we're interested in maximizing the entropy of this model because that will give us the, uh, the model with the uh, um, most amount of information or least amount of assumptions. Uh, but at the same time, there's also some constraints that we like this model to adhere to. Uh, and so in particular, we would like to, um, to we we're constraining the mean activity of neurons so that the model can generate activity that has the same mean activity as what we recorded. Um, I'm also constraining the mean activity of hidden units and the interaction between the visible and hidden layer. Um, and so we're maximizing the entropy and at the same time minimizing these constraints. Um, and so when we derive the solution for P for this uh, uh, um, uh, entropy uh, model, what we get is the Boltzmann distribution, um, which is um, uh, which which gives a defines an energy based on these constraints to every possible state and then uh, tells us which uh, states are more likely and which ones are less likely. And um, so this gives us the, the the shape of the solution, the sh shape of the the uh, equation. And to find the optimal parameters, we need to do optimization. Uh, so we just maximize the log likelihood of the data. And in fact, when we um, derive the gradient descent updates from this uh, likelihood, uh, they simplify very much. So um, if we just look at the, the parameters responsible for the mean activity of neurons, when we do the gradient descent, we see that the update is just the difference in the mean activity of the recorded data uh, and the mean activity of the model. And of course, the mean activity of the data we know because we've, uh, we've gone through the trouble of recording these, uh, these fish. Um, so we can just compute the mean. Um, and for the model, we uh, can sample activity. So using a Markov chain, we sample a lot of samples and compute the mean. And the difference between these two uh, constitutes the gradient update. Um, okay, so, uh, so we let this model learn. So it takes about uh, I don't know, half a day. And then um, it converges to, uh, converges to learn these data statistics. So here I'm showing um, the mean activity of neurons, and on the x-axis we've got the mean activity of uh, the recorded data, and on the y-axis the mean activity of the samples of the model after convergence. Uh, and this is showing a density map of all neurons, so this is about 50,000 neurons um, in one fish. And uh, so these are very strongly correlated, uh, right? So meaning the model has uh, indeed converged, which makes sense because we asked the model to learn exactly this. Uh, and so it, it can now generate activity with the same mean activity. Um, so that's not very surprising, but uh, what is uh, surprising and what we think is very exciting is that this model has also, um, or, or emerges to uh, also model the pairwise correlations between neurons, which is something that, we, uh, that the model was not uh, explicitly optimized to do. So here I'm plotting the pairwise correlations between each pair of neurons uh, 
from the recorded data versus the uh, samples from the model, and we again get very strong correlation. Um, and so these, with 50,000 neurons, there's over a, a billion pairwise correlations that the model captures very well, which, we, which will be computationally unfeasible to uh, optimize explicitly. Um, and just as a control, one of the close uh, uh, competitors it would be a sparse variational autoencoder, uh, which can also model the mean activity, but fails to capture the, um, uh, the correlations between neurons. Um, so uh, we think this is, so this essentially to us uh, shows us that these um, RBMs give us a, so they learn a, um, a hidden low dimensional representation of the data. And we know that this is a physiologically meaningful representation because it, uh, it, it generates the same data statistics as, uh, as in our recording. So knowing that it now makes sense to look at what the hidden representation uh, looks like. So uh, to do this, say we are interested in visualizing the, the blue hidden units, the one at the top, then we just look at which neurons connect strongly to this blue hidden unit, and we visualize only those. Uh, and this is a way of looking what assemblies uh, the model has learned to uh, infer. And so this is again the same picture as the title slide, but now we know what it means. So uh, this is the zebrafish brain, and each neuron I've colored by uh, its strongest connecting hidden units. Uh, and so together, when we optimize the number of assemblies, we find that around 200 assemblies are optimal to model the activity of these 50,000 neurons. And to highlight a few, uh, we see that we have we get, um, like a, a great variety of morphologies. So some, hitting unit, some assemblies uh, connecting to these hidden units are very dense and localized, while others can, be, can connect to different parts of the brain, for example. Um, and so let's... Uh, dive into this a little deeper. So this is one particular assembly. So uh, we're looking at the brain top down and from the and from the left to the right. And here neurons that connect positively to this hidden unit are shown in red and neurons that connect negatively to this hidden unit are shown in blue. And this is actually um, a neural circuit uh, that we know very well in zebrafish and it's called the hindbrain oscillator. So zebrafish have this uh, circuit that uh, oscillates in uh, two populations in antiphase, um, and this oscillation controls a lot of movements of fish, including the eye movements and tail movements. Uh, and so, from our spontaneous activity, our model has uh, has found this is one of the uh, assemblies, which uh, uh, which is good, which is a good thing that it um, that it found this. Um, and so, we find um, uh, we also find its counterparts on the other side of the midline. Um, and then we also find assemblies which have some neurons that are connected to this oscillator at the same location, but also some neurons uh, more anterior in the brain, which uh, control the movement of the eyes. Right? So we have assemblies that model the oscillation, and we have assemblies that connect the oscillator to eye movements. So, um, and, and we also find it on the, uh, um, the, um, the symmetrical part. Um, so. And so this circuit was known, but the, 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 so the, the previous way of finding these circuits was to perform an experiment where you get the same eye movements on every trial, you average the activity, and you find out which neurons reliably activate for a certain eye, move, eye movement. Um, but here we're able to find these just from spontaneous activity and decomposing this activity into the, the uh, populations that make up uh, the activity. Um, and so Finally, uh, I'd like to show you one more thing, which is uh, that using this model, we could uh, derive the functional connectivity between neurons. So given our model, uh, our probabilistic model P, we can now ask, what is the probability that neuron I is active when neuron J is active versus the probability that neuron I is active when neuron J is not active? And we can condition this on all other neurons in the system, so we isolate the connection between, between these two neurons. Um, and we can just analytically derive this solution, and we get a number that uh, gives us the functional connection between two neurons. Um, and so we can perform this experiment for all pairs of neurons in the system, which gives us a, a very large functional connectivity matrix between all uh, pairs of neurons, um, <clears throat> which I've aggregated here to pairs of anatomical regions, uh, just so it's not as, uh, still overwhelming, but not as overwhelming as it was before. Um, and so one cool thing is that we uh, can now compare this to previous data uh, from, um, uh, from our collaborators 
who performed um, a structural connectivity experiment where they trace the synapses of neurons uh, to find out which neurons are connected to which in zebrafish, and um, which also leads to a connectivity matrix uh, of the same anatomical regions, <coughs> uh, but just based on their structural connectivity. And so clearly, <coughs> we can already see some <coughs> similarity. Um, so these, the, the, we find that the structural and functional connectivity uh, are correlated, uh, but also there's some interesting uh, differences uh, uh, that we would like to further investigate. Um, and finally, if we, uh, we can repeat this experiment across different individual fish uh, and compute the functional connectivity matrix uh, for each individual, uh, and I've plotted here the, the correlation between the functional connectivity matrices of different individuals. And we find that, in general, they're very strongly correlated. So even though we have different fish and we record different spontaneous activity, if we use this method to um, decompose the spontaneous activity into these assemblies, and we then compute the functional connectivity based on just the model, uh, we, get, uh, we see that this connectivity matrix is very much conserved across individuals. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude. So uh, I've shown you that um, we've uh, created this model, compositional RBMs, that creates uh, generative models of assembly structured systems, so systems that can be uh, represented by some low-dimensional uh, representation. Um, and our implementation, this compositional approach, where we get a sort of sparse set of weights, scales really well to large systems, um, if you're interested in, in using this. Um, and then we use this to show that high-dimensional neural activity across uh, the entire brain can, in fact, uh, be decomposed in uh, co-activations of these uh, assemblies. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank you for your attention and my, thank my collaborators, and in particular Jérôme Tubiana, who is co first author on uh, a paper that's just come out. Thank you. <clears throat>
and yeah, I think it also sets it apart from um, um, something like PCA or something, which will all the principal components will just connect to all neurons, but sort of in different to account for different uh, sort of yeah high variance events. So yeah, okay, thanks. thank you. Uh, so if we don't have any further questions, let's thank Tice again and.